Military Families Learning Network is part of the E-Extension Initiative and USDA DOD partnership. And so, um, and, and we are hosting this uh, webinar as well as many others. Um, our goal or our, our purpose is to help um, per military family service professionals in what they do and, and part of that is professional development and part of that is helping them connect with each other as well as cooperative extension and land grant uh, faculty. And so anyway, this, is, this webinar is part of the Military Families Learning Network. And if you want to know a little bit more about us, you can find us on Facebook and on Twitter. We also uh, host a blog that covers things like personal finance, but as well as other things that uh, pers uh, military family service professionals would find helpful. And um, if you like to get on the email list for um, notifications about these webinars, you can um, click on or uh, write down that bit.ly link and um, go there and enter your uh, um, email address there. And I think, um, Michael, we're ready to get started. I am going to um, close down this slide um, show and, and you'll have yours. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Michael Gutter and I'm a faculty member at the University of Florida and a member of the Financial Security for All Community of Practice on eExtension, <clears throat> a member of the Military Family Learning Network. Uh, our team represents a group uh, organized in three major subject matter areas, financial security later life, financial security for youth, and financial stability. I, along with uh, other faculty members, including uh, Drs. Carolyn Bird, Deb Panko, and Barbara O'Neill, uh, work together as part of the Military Family Learning Network, and in particular, bring together numerous resources, including today's web conference. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today. I happen to work with him down the hall and uh, have uh, heard this presentation, which I think is one of the better, is uh, one of the more exciting ones I've heard in a long time. Um, Victor Harris received his MA PhD and PhD degrees in Family Consumer Science and Human Development from Utah State University. He's currently an assistant professor at UF in the Department of Family, Youth, and Community Sciences. His research includes close relationships with an emphasis in relationship quality, marriage, and parenting education, and balancing work and family. Uh, Dr. Harris has directed multiple travel study groups to Europe and in fact as we heard just recently got back from a trip which seemed to be rather exciting uh, and hopefully we'll get to learn from that a bit more. But today Dr. Harris is going to share his expertise and present the nine important skills for talking about money on behalf of the personal finance concentration uh, of the Military Family Learning Network. Uh, this builds on Dr. John Gottman's work and uh, we hope that you'll enjoy the presentation and find it very helpful in the work that you do. Uh, as a reminder uh, there will be information at the end of this presentation to uh, remind you about how to obtain the CE credits or CEU credits from AFCPE for those of you with the AFC designation. Uh, again, uh, we'll make sure that that information is shared with you by the end of the presentation. Uh, we look forward to your comments and uh, again I turn it over now to Dr. Harris. Thank you Dr. Harris. Thank you very much and to all of you who have uh, spent so much time uh, working on this to get this uh, put together. Uh, I'm appreciative of all of you who are out there understanding that an hour and a half of your time is very, very valuable and uh, I hope that the things that we discuss today will be something that you can use as you work with uh, military families. Now this first slide as you can see here is really just a, a teacher's outline. I wanted, I actually purposely left these in for you today so that you can see uh, kind of the basis and background of this curriculum because uh, you will be welcome to use it. We will send it to you on CD or even easier uh, we'll just uh, email to it to you or it's it's also as she mentioned going to be posted for your ability to use this. It's called Nine Important Communication Skills for Every Relationship. There's a lot of uh, contextual kinds of uh, circumstances where you can use this. Today we're going to focus specifically on money. So uh, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, the basis of uh, this curriculum. It's really based on the family strengths perspective. Uh, and I don't want to say too much about this except to say that rather than focusing on family deficits, uh, this curriculum really focuses on looking at the strengths of families and then building on those strengths. 
There's also a change model associated with this curriculum uh, that we will introduce you to. And while everybody has uh, their own individual change uh, model, uh, this is one specifically I like to use from David and his uh, David Mays and his wife uh, to kind of just set the stage for what we're really asking people that you work with to do. And that is that you're going to provide them some kind of information, and we hope that uh, during that uh, your presentations and working with them it causes some kind of psychosocial crisis. In fact, I'm hoping today that as we talk with you a little bit, that you will have a bit of a psychosocial crisis with regard to this information that will provide you some kind of insight into, wow, I can really use this to help military families. From there, we hope you'll, it'll provide you a commitment to change or your clients, and then uh, motivate them to some kind of experimental action and you as well. Uh, and again, we'll talk about this more a little bit later. Uh, one of the main principles this is founded on is uh, the principle of change yourself first. In other words, so often in relationships we feel like if uh, other people would just change, then we would be okay. And in reality, we have a lot of control ourselves to change. And if we'll change and, and gain new knowledge and skills, then we can't help but change the relationships around us. And you can see the last step to the model is shared growth. We can't help but help others to change. So this is the teaching model that this is set up, uh, set up upon or founded upon. Uh, it's a model that uh, I've worked on for about 10 years and we've published extensively on this, but I want you to understand the foundation of, of the curriculum with regard to this model. We're going to try and catch the client's attention, get them interacting with you and each other and the information, uh, get to application as soon as we can because that's where changes happen, where they can uh, really see uh, how the information you present can be applied in their own life. We're going to give them some time in the presentation to practice the knowledge and skills that uh, you're targeting and then give them an invitation and usually a tracking sheet uh, to continue to practice those skills at home. Now I know you're already doing this, many of you, but I just want you to know that that's kind of how this is founded and then we're going to pepper uh, this whole presentation or teaching model with fact, think, uh, feel questions and do questions. And they roughly correspond fact questions with attention, interact questions with think, uh, feel questions with apply, and do questions with invite. So as we set this up, there really is uh, an intentional nature of how we uh, put this curriculum out and how we use it. Uh, we need to assess student needs and then as you can see, really try and teach less better two to three concepts or principles that are most important. And so we're going to focus on the four don'ts and the five do's today. Now these are the most empirically tested and research informed skills and communication that we know of from the last nine years. And I thank John Gottman for this and his willingness to uh, spend many, many years to put this together. This represents this presentation and, and this curriculum, an expansion of John Gottman's work and, and an, uh, an attempt uh, to use it uh, in, in, in multiple contexts. Today, as I said, we're going to talk about nine communication skills for talking about money. This then becomes what the delivery model looks like, the attention, interact, apply, and then a, a, a few minutes to uh, practice the target skills cognitively, emotionally, and behaviorally, and then to invite them to further change. So here we are, <laughs> ready to talk about nine important communication skills for talking about money. Now you should uh, have had a, available to you uh, a couple of electronic data information source publications. The first is nine important communication skills for every relationship and that's found online as you can see. The other is ten rules for constructive conflict. Now these are really set up in the same format as you've just seen with a, a little attention idea, getting them interacting with some new information, uh, time for application and then there's uh, uh, some assessments and then a tracking sheet where they can continue to work on the skills skills we're identifying uh, at home. And uh, I've used these in, in multiple contexts without PowerPoint, so if you don't have uh, access to this PowerPoint, you can just take these. They're set up so that you can use them, give them to clients, and so on. In fact, I just, uh, uh, about a month ago, uh, use these in uh, in prison and since we couldn't use staples for the uh, handouts uh, we had to uh, glue stick them together but we use these uh, since there was no technology that was allowed. Uh, 
I want to go to the next slide then and share with you a little bit about the welcome handout that we use when we're presenting. This gives just a quick overview of the class and then a short assessment of why people are there at the workshop. I know many of you are familiar with this, but I gather this right away so that I know how to direct and tailor my comments specifically with regard to the nine skills. Here are our learning objectives for the skills training today, the four don'ts and the five do's in part one and two uh, and we're also going to provide you some opportunities to practice the skills as we uh, had just talked about with our teaching model in class and then also at home. So as we look at this, the nine skills training, uh, knowledge will define here as an awareness and accessibility to information, facts, ideas, truths, and principles. Skills will define as the ability to do something well, usually gained through training or experience. And again, that's where you all come in. So let's talk for just a second, uh, since we're uh, beginning here, about why the chicken crossed the road. Uh, some people would say it all depends on you, who you ask. The kindergarten teacher might say to get to the other side. Plato might say for the greater good. Aristotle, it's the nature of chickens to cross roads. How about Darwin? Chickens over long periods of time have been naturally selected and are therefore genetically disposed to cross roads. Karl Marx, it was an historical inevitability. How about Sir Isaac Newton? If you know anything about the laws of motion, a chicken will continue crossing the road in a uniform motion unless acted upon by some other force. Albert Einstein, did the chicken really cross the road or did the road move beneath the chicken? How about Ralph Waldo Emerson? Now we're getting in uh, into uh, uh, literary comments. The chicken did not cross the road, it transcended it. Robert Frost, across the road less traveled by. How about Ernest Hemingway, if you've ever read anything of his, to die in the rain. Sigmund Freud, the fact that you are at all concerned about the chicken crossing the road reveals your latent sexual insecurities. Sounds like Sigmund. How about the Bible? And God came down from the heavens, and he said unto the chicken, Thou shalt cross the road. And it came to pass that the chicken obeyed and crossed the road, and much rejoicing was heard in all the land. Dr. Seuss, did the chicken cross the road? Did he cross it with the toad? Yes, the chicken crossed the road, but why he crossed, we've not been told. Captain James T. Kirk, to boldly go where no chicken has gone before. Harry Potter, to find the final horcrux and destroy Lord Voldemort. How about Martin Luther King Jr.? I envision a world where all chickens will be free to cross roads. Free at last. Free at last. Richard Nixon? Now we're going to get a little political here. We try and uh, represent both sides here. The chicken did not cross the road. I repeat, I knew nothing about the chicken crossing the road. I'll just let you read this one on your own from Bill Clinton. How about Bill Gates? Who cares? We own the road. We own the chicken. And one of my favorites, Grandpa, in my day we didn't ask why the chicken crossed the road. Someone told us that the chicken crossed the road and that was good enough for us. And then finally Colonel Sanders, founder, founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken. I miss one. All right, so why talk about money? It all really depends upon who you ask. And I want to take this opportunity for just a minute um, to... Uh, to talk a little bit about the context of the individuals you're dealing with. Uh, this comes from uh, the National Conference on Family Relations Report, Spring 2012, Volume 57.1, uh, F4 through F6. And I'm going to share just a little bit of this information with you, to, again, to set the stage or the context for why we're talking about the nine important skills for talking about money. Uh, this comes from Angela Hubner. She's an associate professor in the Department of Human Development at Virginia Tech. And uh, she says this, the military conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan mark the first time in our nation's history of military service that we've attempted to maintain such an involved forward deployment with an all-volunteer force. Today, about 1.8 million troops have been deployed. This translates into 2.7 million family members who have experienced separation from their service member for extended periods of time. The experience of deployment can be divided into three distinctive phases, and I'm sure you're all aware of this, each with its own associated stressors and emotions. First pre-deployment begins when the service member receives his or her orders. It typically involves extended training and preparation for the upcoming mission. Families may become more distancing and argumentative during this phase of deployment as they vacillate between denial and sadness about the service member's departure. Second deployment occurs when the service member begins his or her actual mission 
uh, in or in support of the theater of war, families typically, typically experience a wide variety of emotions during the actual deployment, including relief, sadness, numbing, or even anxiety. These emotions can shift into feelings of independence and control as the deployment wears on. Finally, reintegration occurs when the service member returns to the United States and is reunited with his or her loved ones. This period may start as a honeymoon but end in the reality of renegotiating roles and getting to know each other once again. At the heart of all of these things is the ability to communicate effectively. Service members ranked deployment length and family separation among their top non-combat related stressors. In fact, for some children and youth, parental deployment has been associated with depression, anxiety, lower grades in school, and increased familial conflict. Deployment has also been linked to depression, anxiety, isolation, and sadness for some non-deployed uh, non spouses. Not surprisingly, the adjustment of the at-home parent, the non-deployed spouse, has repeatedly been shown to have the greatest impact on the overall adjustment of the children. And so the communication skills that we're going to talk about today are not just for the individual who's deployed, but the non-deployed spouse as well, and also the children. One of the most important things to recognize when working with military service members or their families is what has been termed the warrior ethos. Service members and their families pride themselves on their strength and ability to successfully confront challenge. The notion of asking for help or support often carries with it the stigma of weakness. Uh, and again, Hubner's talking. She says, in our studies, members have reported concerns about appearing weak in front of their peers or commanders. Commanders have reported concerns of appearing weak to their subordinates. In a culture where respect and teamwork reign, such fears are not unwarranted. No one wants to be considered the weakest link, and many believe their families to be a direct reflection on them. These beliefs, which help make our military strong, can also place service members in a double bind when they do, fi oh, when they, uh, do find themselves in need of support, especially when that support entails uh, mental health or financial services. So I want to just talk about some of the deployment experiences for just a minute and some of the issues con uh, contextually that uh, military families are dealing with. Uh, first estimates are between 77 to 87 percent of OEF and OIF veterans. OEF, as you know, is Operation Enduring Freedom, and OIF is Operation Iraqi Freedom. Those veterans had combat exposure. That is, they were shot. Uh, they shot or were shot at. Thus, the vast majority have been involved in or witnessed trauma. The service member and his or her family need to know that you're aware of the reality of the combat exposure and that you can handle hearing about it. Depression and suicide, as you know, uh, is also an issue. The growing rate of suicide in the military has received increased attention. Given the warrior ethos, it's not surprising that service members must be, uh, would be hesitant to talk about suicidal ideation, even if it were occurring. And sometimes in a financial setting, as you know, these things come out. Survivor guilt. Many service members may be experiencing survivor guilt. Questions like, why did my comrades step on the IED and I didn't? Or why did their f convoy get attacked and mine didn't? Or, or questions that, that may come out uh, in your sessions as you work with them. Also, uh, there are other histories of trauma that are, uh, I think, important to understand contextually, not just in a, 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 the theater of war. According to Seifert and colleagues, 46% of service members report a history of childhood physical abuse, 25% report both physical and sexual abuse, and those who exper have experienced both have a higher rate of developing PTSD. So there are multiple issues besides finances that these individuals may be dealing with. Murdoch and colleagues, 2003, reported that incidents of sexual harassment were reported by 80% of the military women in their study. In other studies, researchers have, researchers have suggested that 28 to 30 percent of female service members have experienced a rape while in the military service. So uh, what that means is that such experiences may be particularly difficult for female service members to make meaning of, given that the assault came from those who were supposed to be on their side. Now, Just a few other things that contextually I think might help before we really dig into talking about money. Uh, PTSD syndrome, uh, and I know you're uh, all aware of that. Uh, you may become aware as you work with people of symptoms of PTSD and their impact on service members' behavior and interactions with others. Uh, drug use, you may become aware of uh, a client's use of licit, illicit, and prescription drugs. Uh, spouses may also have turned to drug use as a coping response during the deployment. Sleep habits, disrupted sleep can be a sign of PTS PTSD and, and other issues. And also anger and rage, are they verbally lashing out at family members? You might see that as you're 
you're working with them? Are they being physically aggressive with others or getting into physical fights? And then risk-taking behavior is another issue you might uh, see as you work with military families. Many returning service members report difficulty adjusting to normal life. After having survived at a heightened sense of alertness for such an extended period of time, a service member may be tempted to engage in risk-taking behaviors in an, uh, in an attempt to get the adrenal adrenaline rest that was such a part of everyday experience in theater. These behaviors may be consciously intentional or not, but, in, uh, but can include driving recklessly, not wearing a motorcycle helmet, drinking too much, engaging in fights, and taking other chances. And again, communication is the heart of dealing with all of these issues. And so the next one is just that, couple communication. Uh, you may become aware of how often the service member and spouse uh, were able to com communicate during deployment, how well uh, they communicate now uh, after the service member has returned home. Infidelity is also an issue you may become aware of. During long separations, the threat of infidelity is high in both service members' and spouses' minds. Note that such relationships can be internet-based with emotional attachments formed at long distances or in person. Unprecedented access to the internet and cell phones, even in theater, makes such concerns really real. And then let's talk just about one more thing before we talk about financial difficulties. Youth internalizing and externalizing behaviors. Falling grades, withdrawal, depression, anger, and sleep issues are all common responses to deployment among children. Some studies suggest that youth, youth have more difficulty with the reintegration phase of deployment than do parents, in part because they're concerned about the potential of their parent uh, for redeployment. And so now let's get to financial difficulties and why talk about money. It's not uncommon for families to experience great changes in their family income during deployment. Uh, finances can often become a point of tension. How have money issues been handled during the deployment? Are couples able to communicate about their needs and the status of their finances? So I share that with you just as kind of a context for what we want to talk about. Now we will focus on uh, talking about money today and the nine skills for talking about money, but I just want to make you uh, aware that uh, these skills can can be transferred into all of these other kinds of areas uh, with military families to help them be successful and to put their relationships on a positive trajectory for success. So again, as you can see, uh, many meaningful and potentially heated discussions take place about money. Uh, I want to just take a second and uh, uh, ask you to think about in your work with military families and you don't need to respond uh, yet but uh, some money issues that people have talked about or even argued about as you've worked with them um, and, and just to reinforce the fact that how we think and talk about money significantly influences our mental health and our relationships so as I said, we're going to focus on the process of communication and we're going to look for your feedback as we uh, move through this presentation today so I know many of you, because you work with money, are really familiar with these money personalities. Uh, I want you to just look at these for just a second and, and think about which money personality you are, and then maybe keep in mind uh, or think about a client and what personality or money personality they are. Uh, if you're spontaneous, um, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. If you're spontaneous, uh, and many of you are familiar with uh, Sybil Solomon's money ha habitudes, uh, money, money encourages you to enjoy the moment. If uh, you're a free spirit, money is not a priority for your carefree lifestyle. If you're uh, security-based, money helps you feel safe and secure. If you have targeted goals, money helps you achieve your goals. If you're selfless, money helps you feel good by giving to others. And if you uh, use money for status, it tends to help you, uh, at least as you think, create a positive image. Now, I want you to look uh, at the money habitudes on the right side and see what some of the possible connections are between those on the right side and those issues and habits that come from real families and real answers. Do you see the connections between those who budget and the money habitudes? Planning for the future? What about impulse buying? Where's that? Excessive materialism? And look at this one, preoccupation with social image. How is that connected with money habitudes? What about this one, using money to control others? As we'll see, uh, power and control is the center of most conflict, and that's why money can become such a trigger uh, in communication and conflict. And then what about addictive behavior? 
So I'd like to take just a second and uh, share with you what uh, healthy financial management looks like. I'd like you to take just a second and, and read this definition on your own, but it really uh, looks at five uh, kinds of things. And I'm going to turn this over to Mike uh, for just a minute uh, to explain to you a little bit about what financial, uh, healthy financial management looks like. And then he's going to share with you just a quick diagram that I think might be helpful as we begin to talk about nine skills for talking about money. Always fun. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things, too, that we have to think about is that financial management is a very complex thing that families struggle with. And, you know, the, the being separated from each other, having to communicate over distances can only add to those challenges. So when we think of just the complexity that people really need to focus on, uh, their earning power, what their cash flows look like, how they're managing and spending that money, whether or not they're able to save for some of the goals, and, of course, what those goals are is always challenging, of course. Uh, borrowing and the utilization of credit, and of course then the protecting against risks, the different, num different types of risks that families are all facing. In general, we often employ a simple model here of financial security and just thinking about the different aspects that families have to navigate. So if we break that down, of course, into cash and credit management, those wealth accumulation, saving for the future, and of course, managing those risks, that's sort of one of the challenges is just the sheer nature of the tasks families need to communicate about. But we also realize that None of these things that families need to engage in are something that happens in a vacuum. Uh, as the family changes, children are born, children grow up, people end up uh, changing jobs, uh, being deployed. So many of these things are going to affect what the family's needs are, what their preferences are, how they want things to manage. The overall status of the economy, there's no question, even in just the last few years, so many of us have been affected in many different ways. And then, of course, the access that people have, getting access to different types of resources, being shut out of banking systems, being unbanked, uh, having access to retirement plans, which, of course, is one of the nice things about the benefits that many people may have available as well. Uh, so just kind of thinking through some of those things and realizing that what families need to engage in is not in the communication aspect of it uh, really kind of is also having a, a confidence and an understanding about the sheer nature of, of the scope of what a family needs to engage in thank you I appreciate that I think that's really helpful so uh, let's look for just a minute at uh, some of the trends uh, over the last 20 or 30 years in for example marriage relationships because 90 percent of uh, people will marry at, uh, marry at some point in their lives uh, looking at how money is associated with these marriage trends I think is pretty valuable so on the right hand side you can see where it says the trend if it's up or down over the last 20 or 30 years and the left hand side you can see uh, how it's impacted marital quality and happiness and I've just included uh, just a number of uh, uh, these specific trends. Uh, for example, educational attainment for men and women, that's gone up. And you can see, obviously, that that's had a positive influence on marital quality quality and happiness. Uh, look at family income. That's gone up and you can see uh, just some of these specific trends. Duration of marriages has gone down. Commitment to lifelong marriage has gone down. That's obviously a negative for marital quality and, and so on. And when I talk about uh, marriage, I, I also want to make sure we're aware that that can also be synonymous with relationship quality. But if you notice the fact that married men working is down, so they have a little more family time, and married men uh, women working is up, uh, that has increased marital power and in general those things uh, because of a, a, an influx or an extra uh, amount of income have impacted relationships positively. So I want to take uh, some time now and this is where we really want to dig into the four don'ts and uh, so let's go ahead and uh, move forward into the four don'ts. So what do we talk about? I want you to think about this for just a minute. Uh, I just shared with you some examples with military families of the kinds of things that uh, they need to negotiate and talk about. Uh, when I work with, with clients and individuals, I typically throw this up and, and just let them talk about some of the things that uh, that matter to them. Uh, what worries them the most? Uh, uh, something they do pretty well, something that bothers them, something they like to spend money on and so on. I'd like you to think about that as we move forward. 
So as we start thinking about some things that we argue about, here are really the eight general categories, gender issues and perspectives, uh, how men and women sometimes see things both similarly and differently, commitment and loyalty issues. Now this is really, really interesting because uh, a lot of the things we conflict about, uh, money may be a trigger issue, there may be something that's left out, it may be division of labor at home, who does the dishes or whatever else, but very often the hidden issues are the issues that are most important are issues of commitment and loyalty. Uh, do I feel like you're committed to me? Do I feel like you're loyal to me? Uh, do, you, do I feel like I can trust you? We do know that from national and uh, uh, statewide surveys that commitment is, and high levels of commitment is one of the biggest things that keeps families and couples together and it's also uh, the lack of commitment is one of the biggest things that pulls them apart. Now there's power and control again, the center of so many uh, conflicts and you can see the connections between power and control and money uh, and which is the next one money and finances sexual issues and ideologies uh, how men and women see these issues uh, differently uh, autonomy and privacy how much time we spend together and how much time we spend apart children and parenting issues uh, Good cop, bad cop. One parent, uh, you know, may spend more uh, time with the child, obviously during deployment, and uh, when they come back, it's easy for one to be a good cop and one to be a bad cop. Uh, one uh, allows the children to get away with things, and one doesn't. And then things like health, nutrition, and, and health care can also be issues. So I want to share with you just a quick example of how this can be, uh, well, just some underlying foundational kinds of things for the four don'ts of communication. This per person happens to be a colleague of mine, and I'm just going to share this with you. Uh, this story. When James's oldest daughter was a newborn, he and his wife uh, lived in a small two-bedroom condo. James and his wife were in one bedroom and their daughter was in the other. James's wife was not working outside the home at the time and he had a 45-mile commute each way to work that required him to wake up at 5.30 a.m. One night about 3 o'clock a.m., James was awakened by the sound of his daughter crying in her crib. First thought or feeling that popped into his head and heart was go attend to your daughter's needs, whether she needed to be changed, held, fed, or covered by a blanket. Almost as quickly as that thought occurred to James, he dismissed it and continued to lie in bed, although he was wide awake now. At the moment that he refused to help his daughter as he felt he should, he began to have some strange thoughts and feelings toward his wife. He began to think how lazy and inconsiderate she was, although she was still sleeping and had not heard their daughter cry. He felt justified in continuing to lie in bed because he was the one who had to get up in a couple of hours anyway to get ready for work. She could take a nap later in the day if she wanted to, and he could not. James was upset that she had not yet heard their daughter cry, and he uh, found himself not only accusing her in his heart of being inconsiderate of his need to sleep, but of their daughter's needs as well. The crying continued and grew in intensity, as, and as it grew, so did James's sense of being victimized. James's wife was soon awakened by the crying and immediately got up to check on their daughter. James did not let her know that he was awake, but as soon as she left the room, he rolled over with a humph, thinking that now he would be able to get back to sleep. However, sleep did not come easily. Now. There are some principles and patterns we can learn from this story. I'd like to give you a second just to chime in on what some principles and patterns of communication are that we can learn from the story of my colleague. Elizabeth says, uh, just because we know the right thing doesn't mean that we do it. Melissa says, I agree. I've been doing this for 12 years and I'm starting to see an unprecedented number of senior, uh, enlisted, and, uh, senior enlisted and officers. I tend to think that this is due to uh, multiple deployments, extensive marital concerns, and the fact that the Army is encouraging soldiers of all levels to seek help sooner rather than later, which I believe the latter is a good thing. Uh, Anna says it's learned behavior. Exactly. And so let's expose this for just a minute. Uh, if you go ahead. Uh, so uh, this pattern of, of victimization is really, really interesting. Now, I want to make sure here that uh, we're clear that uh, this is a pattern in communication that we choose. Uh, when we talked about sexual harassment and, and, and rape and, uh, and uh, physical violence and those kinds of things, 
uh, that's a very different pattern of abuse and violence that we're talking about in playing the victim. Here we're talking about playing the victim because we choose to. Uh, for example, if person one criticizes person two and person two becomes defensive and angry, you can see then that it's really easy for person one to justify their behavior and uh, blame person two rather than uh, take accountability for whatever it is they did to cause the conflict. Uh, this is one thing that children use quite often in relationships uh, is uh, if the if they do something that annoys the parent and the parent reacts with anger then the children can focus on the parents anger and justify and blame the parent rather than looking at their own behavior and being accountable for that behavior as person one. Now, What happens with person one is that it's really easy for them to slip into the victim role and play the victim. Uh, there's another possible pattern for this and it looks like this. Person one criticizes, person two becomes defensive, and because person two has been hurt or offended, it's easy for them to justify and blame person one, and then person two plays the victim. Now here's the problem, and that is as long as anybody is playing the victim, the relationship can't be healed. Conflict can't be negotiated. And this is an underlying foundational problem that so many people, uh, couples, families, individuals in the workplace, uh, use this slipping into victimization uh, rather than dealing with the issue uh, successfully and, and uh, I guess one of the things that's really interesting is people will hold on to that victim victimhood so hard sometimes that they'd rather destroy the relationship than admit that they have any part in the conflict and I think it's really really important to understand that the way we uh, short-circuit this cycle is when we're offended or when we offend others to look at ourselves and the part we play in the conflict Yes, and uh, Christy says these patterns are so common. Exactly. And so one of the things you'll have the opportunity to do as you work with uh, clients with regard to finances is to expose this pattern because you're going to see it over and over and how people use it when they talk about finances. Right? So the question, how do these communication uh, patterns play out when we talk about money, health, relationships, or parenting? Uh, exactly. Uh, some of the kinds of things that you're... Uh, you're sharing with us now. We want to dig into a, a way to short circuit this pattern and it's a principle that I think can underline a lot of what we do when we talk about uh, people not just uh, when we talk with people not just about money but also with any communication concerns. This principle of doing the right thing for the right reason, and this is one of the things I do uh, with uh, clients and individuals regardless of what we're what trigger issue we're talking about. Uh, the first thing I do is I have them think about a time in the last couple of weeks and I'd like you to do this. Uh, I'd like you to think about a time in the last few weeks when you had an opportunity to do the right thing for the right reason and you didn't do it. Uh, and I'd like you to think about some of the emotions that you felt. We're gonna uh, when I work with clients, I just actually have them draw this circle or use this actual handout and list the emotions that they felt when they had an opportunity to do the right thing for the right reason and they didn't do it. And when you're done with that, I want you to, uh, and as you work with clients, have them think about uh, a time in the last few weeks when they had the opportunity to do the right thing for the right reason and they did do it and then to list in the constructive world the emotions that they felt. Now the interesting thing with this principle is that it can cut through so many of the issues in working with families and specifically today in working with military families. We can just peop help people learn this one principle to ask the question what's the right thing for the right reason to do in this situation and then to do it. Sometimes it's to ignore inconsequential behavior. Other times it's consequential and it's something that needs to be brought up. That's the right thing for the right reason. And it may not necessarily be comfortable, it usually isn't when you bring up things like that, but it's important that we do it for the right reason. And if we can't do it for the right reason, still to try and do the right thing. Now if we can practice this principle and teach the people we work with this principle, it can help us short circuit that victim role. 
So now let's talk about the nine skills. We want to talk about the four don'ts uh, specifically, and then we're going to get to the five do's a little bit later. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what criticism looks like. We know from, again, over 30 years of research from John Gottman and others um, that criticism is really attacking somebody's personality with accusation and blame. Uh, things like you never, you always, uh, you're so selfish, you never think about anybody else, that's criticism. We're going to talk a, a little bit later about using specific complaints in communication. And that's actually one of the healthiest things we can do if we do it in a skilled way. We're also going to talk about defensiveness. Uh, what that looks like when somebody brings up a complaint or is critical, it's really easy for us to become defensive and not to accept responsibility. We're going to talk about what defensiveness looks like. Uh, because women tend to be the emotional managers of, of relationships in Western culture, they tend to bring up a majority of complaints, which means they uh, and men as well, but they in general need to really learn how to complain specifically without criticism and then men uh, need to really learn how to accept responsibility and not become defensive. Case in point, uh, a man gets home late and uh, his wife is concerned about him. Uh, she, she brings up the fact that, you know, I wished you would have called, uh, I was concerned about you, and he says, you know, it was only 15 minutes or it was only a half an hour. That's all defensive. Uh, defensiveness. Uh, contempt is what happens when this cycle escalates, and we'll show you this cycle in a little while, uh, where mocking, name-calling, uh, pushing buttons, uh, those kinds of things happen that just escalate the cycle of negativity. And then stonewalling really looks like just refusing to communicate. Uh, when one or bo both individuals in a couple or in families refuse to communicate, the relationship becomes really fragile. So let's take just a few minutes and show you what contempt, defensiveness, stonewalling, and uh, um, criticism look like. This comes from John Gottman's Love Lab, and hopefully this will come up for you now. Um, this is Ann. I just want to make sure. Is this, we had a video that was. Okay, it was connected in through YouTube. Uh, if it doesn't work, that's okay. We can just uh, move forward, but I'll give you a check in, uh, second to see if you can pop it up. That should be it. Getting married. It could be as easy as a visit to the Justice of the Peace, but staying married. Now that can be a much more difficult proposition. Relationships can be damaged, sometimes irreparably, by destructive patterns of behavior. Words, attitudes, even body language that develop over time, sometimes unconsciously. How do you know if you're falling into this trap? Well, John Stossel has come across a unique project that's studying this very question. Researchers have found a window into married life, and they believe it has revealed the secrets of staying together. Here in Seattle at the University of Washington, there's a most unusual laboratory where they study something that, considering its importance, you'd think would have been thoroughly studied already, but in fact hasn't been studied scientifically much at all. We're talking about marriage. For the past 20 years, Dr. John Gottman has been analyzing marriages, trying to predict which ones will fail. They videotape couples and record their emotions, their facial expressions, body language, I needed that... to know, had I done the right thing or the wrong thing. Gottman claims they've now gotten it down to enough of a science that they can predict divorce correctly 94% of the time. Yeah. Well, I had made a mistake in that point, but I guess... They predicted this couple would divorce, and they did. What we're able to do with all this equipment is to see the, the early warning signs before couples may even be aware of them. To get couples to participate in his studies, Gottman runs classified ads. Newlyweds want it. Want to earn $500? I bet you didn't have to shave. Nope. Forgot about it. <laughs> couples that respond, like Doug and Teresa Deitman, are wired up to machines that, for part of the research, record how much they sweat and how fast their hearts beat while they talk to each other. Okay. 130 couples are participating in the study. A major part of the research takes place in this little apartment where couples are asked to stay for 24 hours. Well, they call it an apartment, but it's really just a little room. But it has everything you'd need to spend the night. Microwave oven, 
compact kitchen set here, stereo system, television set, and a beautiful view. The only real problem is that you don't have much privacy, because all day they're watching you. As the researchers watch, they take notes, recording loving moments, disagreements, and the way each spouse talks. Is there belligerence, anger, fear? Does he whine? It's all taken down. Somebody has to have his own way all the time. Doug and Teresa Deitman married two years ago. They've been friends since high school and thought, what could be better than being married to your best friend? We spend time together doing positive things. Or we'll just sit on the couch and not do anything and just be together. And I think that's one of the nicest things that we do right now is just doing nothing together. Interaction seems pretty affectionate. Yeah, I mean, it's not like they... We weren't allowed to tape the Deitman's yeah. first day in the lab, but Gottman invited them to return so he could demonstrate what it's like. To reveal how they interact, he assigns them tasks like building a paper tower. I'm trying to figure out how we're going to pass the piece of paper here. They have scissors. She's taking the role of assistant. He's the, he's the doctor or the engineer. He's thinking about the structure of it. Nothing necessarily wrong with that, says Gottman. In many stable marriages, one partner dominates. Becomes a problem only if the other partner minds. Does Teresa? Don't mess that up too much because we can use that too. It's nice and hard. Aye, Captain. Aye, aye, Captain. Followed by this line. You're not going to be a stupid visor, are you? That's right, she said, stupid visor. She sulks. She withdraws. She pouts. It hurts her that he doesn't include her. You not having fun yet? Mm -hmm. But she doesn't react to it in a forceful way. She doesn't say, hey, what, you know, what are we doing here? That, says Gottman, is a danger sign. When a woman is very compliant and pushes down her feelings of anger. Well, then you do it. That turns out to be harmful to the marriage. Oh. Brad and Gail Adams are participants in the study, too. They've been married three years. Just trying to find out who wants Brett to also it. takes charge of the building of the tower. Of course, we'll start with the black base. What's very different is, is the way the wife acts. And it, she very subtly at some point says... Like, well... What is it going to look like? And he picks up on that. And says, oh, I guess there's another person here. We're doing this together. Oh, right. Okay. I, I, I won't for suggestions here. I'm just... She's not passive. You know, she's in there. And he takes a lot of responsibility once he notices how she feels for really caring about it and showing that he cares about it. It's a galactic patrol. <laughs> Using laughter, humor to diffuse conflict is a good sign for a marriage, okay. says Gottman. And the Adamses do that. I think we're not even drunk. <laughs> the way in which you soothe your partner can be very critical in determining what happens to that marriage in the future. But, like, my, my seven-year-old would say, well, of course, duh. I mean, if they say nasty things to each other, they're more likely to split. I mean, why right. do we need a professional? It's important to know what to, what to score. And it's taken us about 20 years to know what to look for. And what not to look for. Anger, for example, and arguing surprisingly turned out not to predict divorce. Complaining isn't bad for a marriage either. It's not the right Back there. Who says it has to be perfect? Not being judged on perfect. Gottman says anger and complaining are fine because they get the emotions out. Who, uh, Remember the couple who divorced? The husband avoids getting his feelings out. You're able to flow. Your emotions are easily. You can cry easy. You can do all this stuff easily. I'm more of an internal. So that that's why you have so many stomach aches and sores in your mouth and things like that because you won't let your emotions out. If you have somebody. Uh, who really wants to avoid conflict, married to somebody who really wants to confront the conflict, then you've got a real problem. Among all the problems couples have, Gottman says there are four kinds of behavior that are most likely to predict divorce. Well, what we find is that there are what I call four horsemen of the apocalypse. 
these are the four things that happen that are characteristic of couples who are on a trajectory toward their marriages falling apart. And the first one is uh, criticism, and the second one is defensiveness, the third one is uh, contempt, however that's expressed, and the fourth one is really withdrawing in the interaction. Gottman says the biggest predictor of divorce is when the husband withdraws, as this man's doing. We got to try to lean a little bit both ways, don't we? Compromise a little bit. I'll compromise till my compromise is over. Well, that ain't going to work then. Four years later, this couple divorced. The time is up. So what does all this mean for the Dykemans, who by now have finished their tower? So, so we're not architects, all right? Well, here it is. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> and the Adams. Look at their tower. Yeah. Where's the beer at? <laughs> Actually, the size of the towers does not predict a successful marriage. But Gottman sees good signs in the way the Adamses work together. None of the four horsemen, the warning signs, is present. After watching the Dykemans in the lab, however, Gottman does see some warning signs. He suspects they're more noticeable at home. Teresa feels Doug isn't pulling his weight in the marriage. She goes to work every morning at 3 a.m. She loads trucks for United Parcel Service. One thing she loves about her job is that at the end of each shift, she feels she's accomplished something. Things are in order. At home, things are not in such fine order. This is very clean compared to what it usually is. Normally, there's three days with the newspapers on the floor, breakfast, lunch, and dinner dishes stacked around the living room. Um, usually, the kitchen has every pot and pan stacked to the ceiling, dirty. Usually, laundry exploding out of the bathroom or the bedroom and just piles up when there's two people making a mess but only one person cleaning it up. It gets disastrous. Both say the first year of their marriage was the worst. Doug, who's a microbiology student and also works as a lab assistant, was angry because Teresa bounced some checks and because she wrecked the car and then lied about it. I was afraid of him getting angry at me and leaving, which is eventually what happened anyways. He got so angry and so frustrated that he wouldn't talk to me. He just got up and he left, you know, and at that point I didn't think he was coming back. He did come back after a few hours. To me, dishes and laundry and things like that just weren't important if I wasn't even going to be in the same place tomorrow. Around that time, they became subjects in Gottman's study. I see you don't even listen when I talk to you. Here they'd been told, talk about a recent problem. I had no idea if Dad was even coming to town or that we were even going to a Mariners game or anything because you didn't tell me. Now, he has a very crucial decision to make here. How is he going to respond to her complaint? She didn't insult him. She didn't call him any names. She didn't say he was irresponsible, that he was a bad person. Let's see how he responds. That's not true, because I told you on Tuesday that we were going to the Mariners game on Monday, but that wasn't important enough for you to remember, apparently. No, you... He's defensive. He defends himself. Denies responsibility for whatever happened. And then he is sarcastic. He's contemptuous. He, he puts her down. Contempt is uh, a very corrosive thing in a marriage. It ought really to be outlawed and banned in marriages. Gottman says Doug is contemptuous here. That's pretty brilliant to ask him in bed, have a sleep. Contempt also can be displayed in a very brief facial expression, you know, that just lasts a second or two. So, that movement, or this movement, while you're listening to somebody. I even told you when I did He's just as powerful as you're a jerk? Yes. Yet there is some good news here. Well, I think it's just... The problem is I'm not remembering things that are important to you for me to remember, and you're not remembering things that are important for me to remember. He comes back after a lot of uh, defensiveness and a lot of whining and complaining and says, well, you know, maybe each of us don't pay enough attention what's important. He doesn't click off. He doesn't click off, right. 
So that's a strength. How many of your four horsemen do you see in them? I see three. Three out of the four. Criticism, yeah. contempt, defensiveness. But they're not withdrawn yet. They're, they're still in there. Okay, we're going to move forward from here uh, to the next slide. I do have a, a question. Did they stay together 20 years later? Uh, I was actually reading in the John Gottman Marriage Clinic book, and uh, they, uh, they ended up divorcing about uh, three and a half years after they were filmed. Uh, now, it's really interesting to, go ahead, to note that uh, this, this cycle of negativity is the cycle that uh, a number of people you work with will be going through. And, uh, you know, I tell people all the time I can save you hundreds of dollars in therapy by exposing this cycle. Uh, and this is what therapists typically do, and those of you who are financial counselors uh, do this as well. You look at uh, where criticism is involved, what's going on back and forth between spouses couples, partners, and uh, then you look at defensiveness and, and what's being said and how the cycle uh, escalates. Uh, criticism, uh, somebody says something that's critical, the other person doesn't accept responsibility. It may even be that somebody uh, issues a complaint and the other person becomes defensive. It's one of the toughest things I've had to work on and I think most men, again because women tend to be the emotional managers and tend to bring up more complaints than men. doesn't mean that men don't need to become skilled at using I messages and that women don't need to be sk become skilled at not becoming defensive by accepting responsibility, but gender-wise this is how it typical, uh, typically plays out in Western culture. And then it's easy once a person becomes defensiveness for the other person to become contemptuous or defensive for the other person to become contemptuous, uh, rolling the eyes, name calling, stiff upper lip, uh, all kinds of body language, uh, sarcasm, mocking, and so on. The interesting thing is that when uh, this pattern plays out habitually over and over again, that couples tend to move into this last stage which signifies that the relationship is really fragile and that is they begin to stonewall each other they just refuse to communicate and they have episodes of fighting and criticism and defensiveness and contempt uh, but then they just stonewall they just ignore each other or refuse to communicate I knew one couple I worked with for example that uh, the husband stonewalled her for three weeks uh, she pled she begged uh, you know with him to talk with her she said how do I know uh, what to change if you won't talk with me but it became a power and control issue and he was gonna make her pay and when stonewalling happens habitually the relationship uh, is really fragile and and they're on a trajectory for dissolving the relationship uh, so you heard John Gottman say criticism defensiveness contempt were there but uh, he wasn't stonewalling yet now it's important to help clients and and people understand that if it's there um, and these things are there in the relationship we need to we need to help them get rid of these things. Money can become a trigger issue into this cycle uh, and all of these other things that couples fight about and so while we're talking specifically about money um, I just want to make sure that we understand that there are so many other triggers into this cycle. Uh, one of you said it's important to learn the basics, balance and responsibility. Somebody else said finances, uh, money and finances are an easy place to fight for some folks. Exactly, it's one of the big triggers into the cycle and when we get to the mud fight uh, and we'll just call it the mud fight everybody tends to feel really badly about it and so then we have people saying well I'm sorry and I'm sorry and uh, we tend to have a honeymoon period and then we have relative peace but then something happens stress uh, money issues whatever the conflict issues are the trigger issues and then we trigger into this cycle again and so what we know uh, from Gottman's research and, and uh, my research as well uh, with couples and marital quality and so on has, has also evidenced this fact is that when couples and families go through this cycle over and over again it tends to wither away the relationships and the friendships. In fact we know that uh, there has to be about a 5 to 1 positive to negative interaction ratio at least for couples to be happy and functioning, stable, satisfied in the relationships. For children the research suggests that that positive to negative interaction ratio has to be a little higher about uh, 8 to 1 positive to negative interaction.
interactions and that can be higher as well but at least five to one or eight to one so what happens is people go through this cycle over and over as it begins to wither away their their couple friendship for example or their family relationships in their home and this interaction ratio looks more like three to one and then eventually two to one positive to negative for couples on a trajectory for divorce uh, some of the research suggests it's about it ends up being about 0.8 positive to one negative which means now the relationship has become much more negative than positive. And at the beginning of the presentation, we shared, uh, I shared some of the potential uh, problems or issues with military families, pre-deployment, deployment, and post-deployment. And you can see that uh, any of those issues can get couples and families into this cycle and wither away the well-being and uh, uh, relationships in that family and so the key is to as you work with them from a financial perspective to help them understand this cycle using finances as the context to help them understand the cycle and then to help them figure out how to short circuit the cycle right uh, and so you can see the question how might the cycle play out with people when they talk about money health relationship or parenting issues any of those things uh, and issues can get people into this cycle. My question is, how do we help people short circuit the cycle? What part of this cycle of negativity, uh, if we, if, if, where do we intervene? I guess is the big question because negativity is really the major predator to our relationships, uh, couple relationships, family relationships, work relationships, and so on. And so where would you suggest we help people intervene? That's what I'd like to know if you take just a minute and chime in. Diane says uh, major spending decisions and how to make them together. Jana says I found the most productive time with clients to be during their peace period. Very interesting. Um, Roselle uh, says before the marriage occurs. Yes. Uh, Mary Ann says criticism cycle stop it before it gets worse. Diane says financial infidelity. Jerry says probably be easier during times of relative peace. Michelle says uh, to teach them constructive comments and that will have to do with the five do's that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Hugo says uh, tag team with a military and family life consultant. Great suggestion. Uh, Amanda, accept responsibility instead of becoming defensive. Excellent. Budget discussions, Elizabeth says, is where I address how they talk to each other. And uh, Carol says, pre-marriage counseling, not trying to counsel during the mud fight. Exactly. And Bobby Lynn says, realizing each other's needs and family needs. And uh, Diane says, for soldiers and family members, now we use master resilience training an active constructive response. Exactly. Well, I appreciate you chiming in with all of your uh, wealth of experience. Diane says, during the cycle of negativity, the honeymoon period, make peace, learn from the mistake, and agree not to make it again. Uh, so here's where uh, uh, a number of people uh, and therapists and other educators really try and intervene in the cycle. And yes, during the honeymoon period or the period of relative peace are great, uh, uh, great opportunities where the couples and families, individuals are, are willing, to, willing to learn new skills and new knowledge. Uh, in the cycle specifically, we try and short circuit, as some of you suggested, right where criticism uh, is introduced. So somebody becomes stressed and says something that's defensive or critical or something like that and the other person uh, becomes defensive. So what we try and do is is try and get people to use uh, I messages in a skilled way to speak non-defensively and then to help uh, the individuals uh, the other individuals in the relationships to accept responsibility. Uh, <coughs> So uh, Stephen says, shut the door and put on the financial gloves. I'm not giving up my debit card. All right, let's go on. So let's talk a little more about these nine important skills for just a minute. Uh, so criticism looks more like this, and this is how we recognize it in working with uh, couples and families. You never, you always, I accuse you, I blame you. 
Contempt looks like this, as we've talked about, mocking, sarcasm, yelling, mimicking, rolling the eyes, calling names, or even ignoring or invalidating other people. How often with an email, you send an email to somebody, uh, do they just ignore you and not respond back? That's, that's a great way to express contempt. So let's talk about defensiveness for just a minute, because that's one of the big and most important ways that we can short-circuit the cycle. What does it look like? Well, denying responsibility. When somebody brings up a complaint, we say things like, it wasn't my fault. Uh, or we make excuses. I know I said I'd be home on time, but I was only 15 minutes late, right? Uh, rubber man, rubber woman. Somebody hurls a complaint at uh, an individual and the other person just hurls one back and so on. Uh, and, and so they just bounce off each other. What about yes butting? Uh, somebody brings up a complaint and the person says, yeah, I know, but, yeah, I know I said I'd be home, but and so on. Uh, repeating yourself. Uh, just saying or making your own argument over and over again and then expecting the person to finally accept it. Uh, whining. I know I said I'd be, you know, any whining. That's all defensiveness. And then body language. We talked about that with uh, eyes rolling, stiff upper lip, uh, you know, uh, fists clenched and so on. So this is uh, this is typically what we do when working with uh, couples in an educational setting. Uh, we have to choose one based specifically on, you know, what is the biggest trigger issue. Trigger issue. Uh, if it's money, you can see scenario one. If it's a health issue, you can see scenario two. And if it's a parenting issue, you can see scenario three. And so we just have them choose one. And uh, we just have them think, of, think about, for example, in this context, your partner just overdrew the bank account. So we have them use the four don'ts to discuss the issue. Uh, we want them to have fun, but to be nice. So we actually want them to use criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling in a fun setting while you're there, just to highlight with them really what it looks like. Once they've done that, then we move to the next scenario. And this is what it looks like. Scenario one, discuss a recent conflict you had, uh, specifically in the context of this presentation, uh, a money issue that you had. And then discuss how criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling may have been involved in the conflict. And then to identify how they can avoid the use of criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling in future conflicts. This is huge. This is a part of application where they can really identify what it looks like in their own cycle. And then once we're done, and it looks like uh, some interesting things have been added here uh, on the top line, but that's all right. It looks like our minuses didn't end up being minuses. Uh, we, we share with them this target behavior sheet uh, where they go home and, uh, oh, it looks like uh, <laughs> the Ys uh, got cut off on all of those things, which is all right. Uh, but we share with them this target behavior sheet and say, hey, now listen, you practice this a little bit here in the session. Uh, let's, uh, let's have you go home, put this on your refrigerator next to your children's homework or something like that, and, and work on not criticizing during the week. What does that look like? Uh, a positive if they uh, don't criticize, a negative if they do. Uh, and then we come back in the next session or the next educational experience, we assess, well, how did it go with uh, the four don'ts? All right, now we're going to take a few minutes and uh, move you through what we do for the five do's. Effective communication. Here's our brief attention idea if you were here at the beginning uh, to catch attention. Getting more exercise lately really means the batteries in the remote are dead. I got a lot done really means I found Waldo in every picture if you're familiar with the Waldo books. Take a break, honey. You're working too hard really means I can't hear the game over the vacuum cleaner. You know I could never love any anyone else really means I'm used to the way you yell at me and I realize it could be worse. Just a couple of others. This relationship is getting too serious really means I'm starting to like you more than my truck. I know exactly where we are. It's that direction thing sometimes that couples deal with. Really means no one will ever see us alive again. And then finally, will you marry me really means both of my roommates have moved out. I can't find the peanut butter and we're out of toilet paper. All right, so uh, then we take him to what would you say again? And uh, we give them the first scenario. You check your account and notice there's been an unexpected large expenditure. You suspect your partner is the culprit. Or if it's a health issue, you tell your partner about a health or nutrition concern you have regarding them, and they become defensive. 
or if it's a parenting issue, your partner is upset about how little you or your children are doing to help around the house. We ask them to ask and just discuss what would you say, or if it's more relevant to a specific situation they've gone through uh, recently, we ask them to talk about that. And then I share with them, and we share with them 10 rules for constructive conflict. And we want to introduce these rules uh, right here so that they get a sense of, wow, there really are some specific rules that we can use and engage in that can help us not to get to that mud fight in the cycle. So the first one has to do with the four don'ts, refuse to use destructive conflict tactics. And so we talk a little more about the four don'ts. The second has to do with the five do's that we'll talk about in this presentation. Choose to gain the skills to conflict constructively. Rule three, focus on feelings first, then move to the specific issue. This really has to do with I messages. This is how I feel when this happens because. And focus on one issue at a time. Uh, some researchers have called this gunny sacking. I really took the top 10 or 15 conflict resolution specialists and then synthesized the best of what they had to say down into these 10 rules. But I, I know we've all been a part of a situation, and you, when working with couples uh, and families with regard to money, uh, have seen this situation where somebody advances a money issue, and then somebody else says, well, three weeks ago you did this. And then somebody else says, well, a month ago you did this, and uh, six months ago, and pretty soon everybody's throwing in all of these issues and then no issues are getting discussed. It's really easy to get them to the mud fight when this happens. So it's important that we teach uh, the people that we work with to be able to call time out. Wait just a second. Uh, that's another issue and that's important and, and we need to discuss that. Can we focus on this issue uh, right now? Rule five, identify the patterns of behavior that reveal the root cause of the issue. We talked earlier about uh, things couple fight about. And, uh, you know, some of the money issues or other things that they fight about uh, may be really symptomatic of deeper issues like commitment, like loyalty, like intimacy issues, like trust issues. I don't feel safe around you. I don't feel like you're thinking about me when you come home late and, and you know I'll worry and so on. And so these are deeper issues than uh, just you know, being 10 minutes late. And then this principle that Stephen R. Covey has made really famous, think win-win. Uh, that's really, really important for people to understand is that if one person in the relationship loses and, and one wins, the friendship loses. Uh, and so to think win-win. And then rule seven, learn to calm yourself. This is really, really important. Uh, how we help uh, couples and families understand what it is they do to soothe themselves or calm themselves. Some people exercise, some people listen to music. One of the keys here is to be able to call time out uh, and to be able to say, you know what, I'm afraid I'm going to say some things I don't mean, that's contempt, or to be critical, and I need to call a time out for a few minutes. One of the problems is, is, uh, is that uh, when, uh, when people call time out, they don't set a time for when they will get back together and talk about it. So they call time out, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to say some things I don't mean, but then they don't set a time to talk about it. And it leaves the other person who issued or brought up the complaint feeling invalidated. And so, uh, you know, one of the myths is that, you know, we never go to bed angry at each other. Uh, we just can't give up that much sleep, honestly. And so uh, my wife and I, uh, when we're discussing financial issues, we know that after 8 o'clock at night, that's just taboo. And so if we start to discuss it, one of the other calls time out. And then we say, you know, can we talk about this in the morning when we've had a little bit more sleep? Rule number eight is really also uh, really important also. Uh, learn to calm your partner. I know when my wife will be discussing potential financial issues or children issues, she'll generally preface it with a statement like, uh, this is not that big of a deal, but I want to talk with you about... Or have you heard about? Uh, she'll also. You know, humor is a great way to uh, learn to calm your partner as well. All my wife has to do is act like she's going to tickle me, and uh, immediately I'm I'm soothed. Uh, rule nine. Uh, is to be congruent in your communication. I don't know how many of you uh, have ever been disappointed on a birthday or uh, on another holiday where gifts and things are exchanged, but uh, to say what you mean and mean what you say is really, really important. Uh, and so we decided years ago that uh, when, uh, when we would have a birthday, Heidi and I, or with our children, we would ask them or each other uh, what it was that uh, the individual whose birthday it was wanted to do for their birthday and then the other the other person or individuals would make it happen and 
Uh, we had some really, really interesting experiences. On one occasion, I asked my wife, what do you want to do for your birthday? And she said, hey, I want to fly. And so I called around to the local airport, and for $65, uh, we could go up for an hour with the uh, the flight instructor. And so we got up uh, above our uh, town, and about 15 minutes into the flight, uh, the instructor asked my wife if she wanted to take the yoke, and she said, sure, and I was in the back saying, no, <laughs> we'll all die, and uh, she flew for about 15 minutes, and that was it. She's she's about uh, a month away from getting her pilot's license. So I think this is really, really important that we learn to say what we mean and, and mean what we say. Uh, number 10. Uh, rule number 10. Seek closure and to resolve this specific issue as soon as possible. The longer uh, we leave the issue and the resentment and the negativity uh, uh, open and around, uh, the more likely it is that those will deepen and it's more difficult to heal the relationship. And so the key is is to try and deal with those issues as they happen, whether they're financial issues or other issues. Now, the, the thing we're dealing with as you deal with people is that some people have grown up in their homes and their family of origins and they're, they've really learned to avoid conflict. And some have grown up to uh, really confront conflict. And so if you bring a, a conflict avoider and a conflict confronter together in a relationship, specifically with regard to financial issues, it can make for a really volatile situation and uh, get people to the mud fight uh, quite quickly. And so, uh, you know, Heidi, for example, my wife grew up in a conflict confronting family and I grew up in a conflict avoiding situation and so it uh, you know when we talk about money and other issues uh, it, it became pretty volatile uh, sometimes till we began to learn these skills and practice them I've since begun to really really appreciate her style that if there's an issue uh, we deal with it right away and uh, I never there's not a hidden agenda I never have to worry where I stand with her uh, that has also to do with rule 9 being congruent in your communication so now let's talk about the five do's a little more specifically. Um, this video we're not going to show you because of time, but it's available on Amazon. It's John Gottman 2020 Fair Fighting. So uh, actually, let's go back to the previous slide. Not the video, but this one. Go for it. Right there. So what the five do's look like is what we've talked about in the 10 rules for constructive conflict and that is uh, to be able to calm down, soothe yourself and soothe your partner. Uh, once our heart rate gets to about uh, 90 beats per minute we move into a zone Gottman, uh, Gottman has uh, exposed called flooding and when we get flooded emotionally we tend to say and do things as you know that, uh, that we don't mean and it's easier for us to get to that mud fight. To speak non-defensively uh, means to use a soft voice um, and uh, to use a voice that doesn't uh, put the other person on the defensive. Say things and do things that put the other person on the defensive. Using specific complaints, I messages, that we'll talk about in a minute, and then to validate. That's to um, learn to listen with your eyes, focus on the person, your ears, to really listen to what they're saying, uh, not just the next thing that you're going to say to their uh, needs being expressed. What is the need behind their concern if they bring up that we're, uh, that, you know, that I'm late, for example. Uh, what's that need? Uh, is it a trust need? Is it a commitment need? And so on. Uh, so learn to listen with eyes, ears, uh, mind, uh, and then heart or listening to the needs being expressed. Bridge words are also really, really important. Uh, bridge words are those words that let people know that we're really listening. And then what happened, for example, or what did you do then, or how did that work out, and, and so on. And then again, to overlearn the nine skills, it's really, really important uh, that we overlearn these skills so that we have them to use when we get angry or frustrated. So here's the video that you can purchase on uh, Amazon if you'd like, and it really highlights these steps to fair fighting. First, to soften your startup. That has to do with speaking non-defensively and to use uh, I messages. Secondly, learn to make and receive repair attempts. If, uh, if there's a conflict, if there's an issue, to try and figure out how we can soothe ourselves and soothe our partner and immediately begin to deal with the issue rather than let it fester. Uh, soothing yourself and each other, as I said, learning to calm down, calling time out, uh, those kinds of things that are integral. And then to compromise, learn to accept your partner's faults. That's, uh, 
That's important, uh, that a lot of the big issues never really change because their uh, habits and their personality quirks that our partner has. And that's why we let people know all the time that the 80-20 the rule is really important, and that is to focus on the 80% about the person you really appreciate, not the 20% that drives you crazy. And uh, we all have that as a part of our personality. So Gottman says to keep the focus on fondness, respect, and, and admiration. What does that look like in their relationship? Uh, saying I love you and how they say that, touching hello, touching goodbye, uh, you know, keeping a promise, uh, doing some kind act of service, but all of those kinds of things that are part of that five to one positive to negative ratio that, that helps keep the relationship in a positive state. So let's look at these uh, nine skills specifically from the five do's a little more carefully and a little more closely. This is what I messages look like. I feel when this behavior happens because we describe a feeling and I know you, you're aware of this, uh, identify a behavior and identify a reason for why you feel that way in the behavior. This is what accepting responsibility looks like. I'm sorry, I understand now uh, that this caused you some concern and, and I apologize. How can what can we do together or what can I do so that this doesn't happen again so that you don't worry about me or so on. I now realize uh, those kinds of things are all accepting responsibility kinds of statements. Speaking non-defensively, reducing the emotion, soft startup as we talked about, and then as I said validation, listening with the eyes, the ears, the mind and heart, and then the needs and emotions being expressed and using bridge words. Now this is what we do once we teach this. Uh, go ahead is we, uh, we focus on this cycle of positivity and what it looks like. Uh, very different than, very different than uh, the, the uh, other cycle, and that is that uh, complaints or I messages replace criticism. This is how I feel. We soften it because uh, we accept responsibility, or the other person does, uh, instead of being defensive. Uh, we're calm throughout. Uh, we speak non-defensively instead of being contemptuous as we're discussing issues. And we validate and appreciate instead of stonewall, right? And the thing is, and we do know this, that, that couples can really learn these nine skills in families. And, and instead of getting to the mud fight, we can really have constructive conflict. The interesting thing is that the honeymoon period still happens because they feel good about the fact that they didn't uh, get to the mud fight and relative peace remains. Uh, learning how to promote this cycle of positivity and the knowledge and skills that allows people as they talk about money to conflict constructively is one of the greatest things I think we can teach people because not only uh, does it uh, filter down into uh, their children's relationships and their family communication, but in all other kinds of issues that they discuss and talk about. So uh, then this is what we do. And again, uh, with the teaching model we showed you up front, we have them practice using I messages. And we keep the scenarios on the left-hand side the same. For example, uh, or the statements, you never call. Uh, the positive way to say that is, hey, I really like it when you call. You can see some of the others. You're, uh, you're always late. That's stupid. All of these are defensive speaking. And uh, they can put people in the cycle quite easily. Speaking non-defensively, we then have them practice using I messages with a soft voice, low emotion. Uh, you never call, will I feel this uh, because of this behavior, and so on, right? Then we have them accept responsibility. Uh, and this is really, really important as we've talked about. You never call, you know what, honey, you're right. I need to call you more rather than, well, I was only 10 minutes late slipping into defensiveness. And we go through all of these scenarios. Now, if it's a, a couple class, then we have the couple discuss these and then uh, together and then talk about uh, how they, w they, will, they will handle these and practice these five do's. If it's in a class that's not a couple class, then we just do these together as a group. Validation, determine the needs and emotions being expressed. You never call, well, uh, I'm not feeling loved or I'm feeling lonely or, or hurt, right? Uh, and so on. And we look at those needs and emotions so we have them practice that. And then we have them uh, do this, uh, a scenario, an application scenario with validation and appreciation, uh, practicing listening with the eyes, ears, mind, and heart. We have one partner tell a recent story of an experience they shared together that they really enjoy. 
and then the other person uses bridge words and listenings with their uh, listening with their eyes, ears, mind, and heart to validate what they're saying. Right? Then we have that same person tell a recent story of an experience they shared together and why they enjoyed it. And the other partner then use bridge words and listening with their eyes, ears, mind, and heart to validate what they're saying. We want to make sure that we really reinforce these skills in the teaching setting. So then we give them a scenario. Discuss a recent conflict you had, money, health, or relationship issue. Discuss how calming down, complaining, speaking non-defensively, and validation could have been used to negotiate the conflict more effectively. And then we have them identify specific ways they can calm down, complain, speak non-defensively, and validate in future discussions to short-circuit the negative cycle of communication. Now, this particular piece is really, really important, and we really discuss you know, uh, issues and scenarios and, and what they would do and so on. This is a really important part of putting it all together, as it says here. Uh, and so we want to really take some time with couples to work with them here. Then finally, we review the antidotes to the four don'ts. Uh, criticism, complain without blame, uh, using I messages and speaking non-defensively, uh, what it looks like to avoid contempt, building a culture of appreciation, and a lot of that is through validation, how we get rid of defensiveness by taking responsibility, and validation is a big part of that, and then how we help them avoid stonewalling, uh, to do physiological self-soothing, to keep them from the flood zone, and to learn to calm down, call time out, those kinds of things. We look at the cycle of positivity again, and then we put the uh, the rest of it together with the cycle of negativity and what that looks like, just to reinforce that this is really what we're working on. These nine skills, uh, specifically in the context of what we're talking about today, can really help them uh, avoid getting to the mud fight and can really help them when they discuss finances and financial issues uh, to stay away from things that will harm their friendship and the relationships in their families. So then we give them this uh, uh, target sheet or target behavior sheet. Again, it's a little messed up, but uh, on the PowerPoint that you'll get, it won't be. That just has to do with uh, apparently the slides that you're viewing. Uh, and invite them then to practice these skills at home. Uh, and then if you're going to see them again for another session to uh, take the first five or ten minutes, as you know, to talk with them about how they're doing and then reinforce these skills throughout all of the sessions or educational experiences with them. We reinforce uh, the uh, learning objectives and outcomes. And what we're trying to do here, that is to, uh, to increase knowledge and to increase skills and then really define what uh, relationship satisfaction looks like as a positive perceptual evaluation of the health of a friendship and the levels of well-being each member of the friendship experiences and then to reinforce again as I will with you that how we think about and talk about issues influences our mental health and our relationships it it really does and and the nine skills are really the process by which we can help couples and families uh, in the military uh, short-circuit some of the negative cycles that are getting them to the mud fight Again, the process is the key to success. So I want to wish you all well in your work with uh, military families. I appreciate uh, taking the time today to be able to discuss these things uh, through a webinar format. Uh, one of the things I'll ask of you go for it, is if uh, you decide to use uh, any or all of this uh, curriculum that uh, you make sure to give this, uh, and this has been IRB approved, but you make sure to give the people that you work with uh, this evaluation and uh, and then you send it as you'll see if we we'll go to the next slide and then if you'll send it back to me. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, perfect. Uh, you can see in the bottom right hand corner, uh, please send all feedback to me. And so uh, this is really what we get out of this, our ongoing uh, study of how the effectiveness of uh, the nine skills. We're using it across uh, Florida right now for the Master Money Mentor program, uh, teaching money mentors these skills as we're doing uh, with you, and and uh, a number of them are using that as they work uh, using these skills as they work with clients. So uh, it looks like we've got about two minutes. Um, <clears throat> Christy says this webinar incorporates MRT and Seven Habits in one presentation. Thank you for offering this wrap-up. Look forward to uh, receiving this PowerPoint. 
Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we've got just a minute or two that we can uh, address them now. So, and just a reminder, uh, the slide should be up now for those of you who, uh, who have uh, been paying attention. And we really appreciate uh, your participation today. There's been some great comments we've heard from everybody. A reminder about the process to obtain the continuing education units from AFCPE for those of you with the AFC designation. Remember, you must be a registered AFC with AFCPE. And then please send an email to AFCCEU at gmail.com with your name and the phrase communication skills somewhere in the body of the email. And please send this email no later than Friday, June 29th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're certainly welcome to send it now so that you don't forget and let it escape you. Um, and again, certainly uh, if you have some additional questions, uh, Dr. Harris is still available for another few moments, but uh, we want to make sure everybody uh, understands the process and uh, follows through on their CEU credits. Uh, and of course also uh, to uh, remember also to uh, complete the evaluation for us as well. We appreciate your feedback. Um, and of course, uh, as always, thank you all for participating today. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, if you, again, we'll turn it back over to Victor should any of you have any additional questions. And you should see the polls now coming up. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, the evaluations. This is what helps us move forward, and so I appreciate the time uh, that you will take to go ahead and do those. Also, looking forward to uh, hearing from you on how well you're uh, using this, and uh, if there's anything else we can assist you with, uh, my email is there in the evaluation, and uh, I'm always willing to help.